welcome to the second to what we hope to be annual faculty author spotlight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Melissa Chimintra. I am the scholarly engagement librarian for the um, social sciences um, and geospatial data. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating our last of three wonderful sessions of this Spotlight series. Um, so sort of how today will run is that we have three pre-selected questions we'll be asking of our faculty authors, and then we'll have some time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, before I introduce you to our authors, though, I do want to thank um, Amanda Morlas, Courtney Kearney, and Alan Velasquez for all of the work they've done to make this celebratory event happen. Um, I'm thrilled that we were able to continue this event this year despite its challenges. Um, one of my favorite things, we were just chatting about this, um, about this event is that it brings faculty um, from across campus and across disciplines together in one place to sort of share and discuss um, accomplishments. I know that doesn't always happen um, for most of us. Um, but with that being said, I do want to introduce to you today's brilliant faculty authors. So joining us today, we have Michael Brombog um, from the Department of Classical Studies chatting with us about their work titled The New Politics of Olympus. We have um, Charles Figley, um, who is the Chair in Disaster and Mental Health from the School of Social Work, chatting about um, combat social work, applying the lessons of war to the realities of human services. Um, we have Elizabeth Gross from Tulane Honors Program um, with This Body, That Lightning Show. We have Jenna Lippman from the Department of History, um, chatting about their work titled In Camps, Vietnamese Refugees, Asylum Seekers, and repatriates. We also have Felicia, Felicia McCarran from the French department um, chatting about One Dead at the Paris Opera Ballet, which is, I think, my favorite title. Um, I don't mean to be biased, but it's great. <laughs> uh, and then last, but certainly not least, we have Jonathan Morton from French as well, um, live from Berlin. Um, and the title of their most recent work is, and uh, Dr. Moore, and you say it much better than me in your um, beautiful video, but the Roman de la Rose and 13th century thought, um, you can uh, share the much more beautiful pronunciation <laughs> if you'd like. Um, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in this moment so I can see all of your lovely faces again. Um, so like I said, we have a few pre-arranged questions to ask all panelists, and then we'll have time for questions from attendees at the end. Because this is the Zoom webinar platform, um, all uh, attendees are muted. So we encourage you to, if you have, if you wanna chat amongst yourselves, obviously use the chat feature during this time. Um, when it comes time for the Q&A, please use the Q&A function. Um, it'll allow us to better manage the questions so that we may um, address them um, in a more, um, a more manageable fashion, I guess. So I'm gonna jump right in and you can, I'm gonna ask the question and then um, y'all can just answer. There's, I'm not gonna go around and call on anybody. I don't wanna put any pressure. If you don't feel like answering the question, you don't have to. If you're like, nah, I don't really like that one. I'll wait for the next one. That's totally fine. This is meant to be um, informal discussion and fun. Like I said, the last thing we wanna do is to celebrate your work and then make this also feel like work. Um, so the first question is how and why did you choose your book or research topic? Uh, I guess I can start things off. Um, the book that I wrote is um, about ancient Greek hymns, um, which are songs of praise and how they work in a political context. And the reason I chose that topic is because in the ancient Greek world, um, 
a very important part of social life, political life, religious life was song. Um, it's something that we don't maybe necessarily think about as much because we have a lot of other types of entertainment and media in our lives. Um, but for the ancient Greeks, uh, song was really, really dominant. It took up a lot of their attention, especially in within elite culture. Um, and hymns in particular are ways of praising people. And what that does in addition to making you feel good is it helps define what the socially acceptable standards and norms are within a community. And so when you praise someone for doing something, you are reinforcing and setting the ground rules for the rest of the community about what praiseworthy behavior is. Um, and that had been studied in, in some sort of formal literary ways, but the, the social and political ramifications of that kind of praise uh, hadn't really been explored in too much detail. Um, and so I thought that would be an interesting topic to look into. Um, and particularly, I look at how it works in these sort of new emerging authoritarian regimes. Um, now, when I started this project a decade ago, um, that seemed more abstract than it seems today. And so the tail end of this book uh, was, was finished during a, a very different political climate in the US. And it gave me a lot of insight into thinking about how um, norms can change rapidly and suddenly in a way that, you know, a lot of your society thinks things are very fixed and static and then all of a sudden things can change in surprising and unexpected ways. And so that was a really, kind of interesting moment in our own lives that informed uh, some of the underlying assumptions that I was working with in my book. I can, I can go, I can, so my, my book, my book topic, uh, the reason I chose it was because I got bullied by a bigger boy. And um, so I, this is, so my book is called The Roman Laros and 13th Century Thought. There you go, Melissa, The Roman Laros. And this is the um, this is the second book that I've done. This is an edited collection. It's a collection of essays that came out of a conference. So I'd already written one book on this topic, and what happened was I was at um, a conference that I'd organised, talking to a very very senior guy in the history of medieval philosophy. So I'm a medieval specialist, and I may have had I might have had like one glass too many of fruit juice, and I had. Um, I said to, I basically said to him, why does everyone, why do all like medieval philosophy people, when you study, when you look for literature that's interesting in the Middle Ages, why do you always look at Dante and the Divine Comedy, which is this like big 14th century, 13th, late 13th century Italian work. And I said, why don't you talk about the Roman La Rose, the Romance of the Rose, which is the thing that I work on. And the thing that my book was on, my first book was on philosophy and the Romance of the Rose. And anyway, he then uh, I, I I didn't think anything of it. And six weeks later, I got an email from him saying, uh, I was thinking about what you said. That's great. Let's organize a conference together. And so I had, so I was like a very junior postdoc and I had like the biggest name in medieval philosophy, which, okay, it's not a big thing, but you know, in the small pond, he's like a reasonably large sized fish. And he said, let's do a conference together. So I kind of had to say yes. And so, um, and so I, we brought together loads of um, people who are specialists in philosophy and people who are specialists in literature uh, to make them talk to each other. And, um, and so my kind of revenge for being bullied into organizing the conference that became this book was to make loads of philosophers do something they didn't want to do, which was uh, think about what happens when words can mean like five different things at the same time. Uh, and philosophers really don't like that. So they had to get, so basically we made all of these poor historians of philosophy read this incredibly weird, obscene, philosophical French poem. And when we'd finished write, wiping up the tears, we persuaded them to uh, collaborate and bring out this volume. So what happened was, I thought I was the expert in this topic, like I'd written about the Romance of the Rose and philosophy. I thought this is my thing. And at the conference that, that then became this book, I realized they, I, they were all of these things, I was so far out of my depth which was really exciting. And so the result is this is like a book. Okay, one other thing I did, I bullied everyone to reference my book in this. So there are loads of references to me and they, they had to do it because I was the editor. And so out of politeness, at least, there are loads and loads of people who are quoting me. So it looks like I'm important. And so that's what happened. That's how I ended up doing this book, which is the, the, this one. 
That sounds terrifying. <laughs> you make it sound so great. And there, you know, you tied it up into this nice bow towards the end where you, you know, now you have this thing in which all these folks reference you, but uh, you know, being bullied by the bigger boy. <laughs> I hope there are no um, uh, doctoral students uh, attending right now. <laughs> they might just be scared now. <laughs> I'm happy to go, but I feel like Felicia, you should go next. I feel like the French theme could continue. Do you want to jump in and then I'll go after you maybe? Okay, if you want. I'm not going to be bullied. Um, so, um, you know, I think when you've written a lot of books, you forget actually why you've done it. Um, but this particular one came from the fact that as a historian of performance, I've been thinking a lot about the way the stage, um, you know, talks about difference, right? Talks about gender or race or diversity, human diversity. And in particular, um, all of my work has been focused on choreography. So when people on stage don't necessarily play human roles, but they might play wordless roles representing flora or fauna, right? And then this idea that that sort of biodiversity that you see on stage in choreography, in particular in the French tradition, can really speak about human diversity. So that's what I was working on. And then it just so happened that um, I came across a recent staging of an old uh, ballet from 1866 that is kind of unbelievable and representative of a whole genre of so-called Orientalist ballets, right? But it had two key things that were very, very um, current still, right? It had a kind of stereotypical representation of others, and in particular Muslim others, right? And there's actually a knife attack in the ballet from 1866. Um, and then there's also a narrative about the green world and actually there's a kind of environmental crisis at the end of the ballet. So um, when they restaged this at the Paris Opera in 2011 and then 2014, it was incredibly um, current, right? These are things that France is struggling with very much um, today. And um, I was able to start thinking about what in French is called decolonizing the stage, thinking about minority representation um, in a way that only now is really starting to happen in public discourse. Many of you may know in France, it's actually illegal to gather data on um, racial or religious or ethnic identification. Um, and so there isn't really a public discourse about this. And my argument is that the stage, even the ballet stage, opens that up and really starts to address these questions that are so urgent right now. Great. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I have to say, it's just great to hear about all my colleagues' work. I feel like it's wonderful to hear about our intellectual work and not just about, um, you know, administrative COVID details. So um, welcome to everyone. Um, my name's Jana. Um, I'm a historian and I teach US 20th century history and US foreign policy and immigration. Um, and I look at issues of migration and race in a way that's really different than um, Felicia. Um, but my recent book is called In Camps, Vietnamese Refugees, Asylum Seekers and Repatriates. Um, and it comes um, out of some research I was doing about Vietnamese refugees who were in a small base camp in the United States in Arkansas. And I started doing research um, about this group of Vietnamese who left in 1975. This is the end of the Vietnam War. And I found these just remarkable photographs um, of Vietnamese refugees who are brought first to Guam before they are brought to the United States. And while they were in Guam, a small group began to protest because they don't want to be resettled in the United States. In fact, they wanted to go back to Vietnam. Um, and they start marching around with pictures of Ho Chi Minh. Um, and if you know about anything related to Vietnamese refugees in the United States, you know the majority are um, identified with anti-communism. Many of them supported the United States during the war. And so I was really struck as a historian of the Vietnam War and US foreign policy to find these images of people who did not want to come to the United States, who wanted to go back to Vietnam. And this would have been in you know, May of 1975. And I was like, I don't think I'll find anything about this. You know, this story will be a dead end. It'll be an interesting, you know, anecdote. And what I found was massive amounts of material. 
And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And so I decided to start following the stories of Vietnamese who leave Vietnam. I end up not just looking at those who leave in 75, but I look in the late 70s, the 80s and the 90s. And I begin to look not just at the initial group of Vietnamese who left in 1975, but those who left later, and who found themselves in other refugee camps in Southeast Asia and Malaysia, Hong Kong and the Philippines. And I write about their stories when they're in between the United States and Vietnam and the experiences and political movements that they participate in in those places. And in some ways like Michael, um, I began this project you know, more than 10 years ago now. Um, and so there have always been questions about refugees and immigration in America, but it was a different political climate. And so as I was continuing to do research, um, it um, in many ways resonates with contemporary debates about refugee admissions, about um, having asylum seekers who are now detained in American jails, um, particularly in Louisiana, which has a huge number of people incarcerated who are asylum seekers here um, in our state. And so while the work is very much about Southeast Asia and Vietnamese in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, I think it really resonates with contemporary questions about asylum seekers, refugee status, and um, migration today. Thanks. Thank you. Does anybody else want to add? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'm, a, I'm a poet and my, um, my book that came out in 2019, This Body That Lightning Show is my first full collection of poetry. So the role of research in that process is um, very different, especially since um, This Body That Lightning Show is, uh, is, is a fairly autobiographical <laughs> work. So a lot of my research involved um, living my life um, and specifically um, connecting um, the, the, the traumatic events surrounding Hurricane Katrina and the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina to um, uh, personal traumas, both um, sexual and physical injury that I was uh, also going through at the same time and became uh, uh, inextricably linked in my own imagination and my own emotional processing. And, and that's kind of the origin of the work. That said, there, there is some research in, in the book, um, it, which it contains um, what I like to call irresponsible translations from Sappho. Um, I do read Greek, but most of that Greek is gone anyway, so I'm going to do what I want and what serves me with it now. And, um, and also there's a central poem in, in the book that's a little, that's longer called um, Amazon Amaki, um, that is an Amazon Amaki, uh, a, a battle of, with Amazon women. Um, and uh, I did some, some research into uh, various names of uh, mytho-historical Amazon women warriors as I was working on that, that poem. Um, it's hard to remember the details because I first wrote that poem in um, 2008. Um, <laughs> and this book was um, first written uh, as um, my MFA thesis um, in 2010 and 2011. Um, so it was a long road from writing the book to publishing it. Um, uh, as well. Um, in terms of uh, the role of research in my creative work, though, um, there, there are a number of other topics that, that kind of touch on things that have come up in other um, faculty topics in, the, in this panel. Um, my second as, as yet unpublished full collection is, uh, began as an erasure of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice and um, then expanded to include uh, narrative and almost documentary poems uh, about working with refugees in a camp outside of Thessaloniki, Greece. Um, so that's um, what I've been working on more recently. And, um, and in, in terms of active research, um, for creative work. I'm also working on a libretto uh, with a composer here um, about an environmental activist orca whale, J35, um, and um, looking into um, that, that research goes in lots of different directions, including how to write a libretto, which I've never done, um, but also um, 
a little a little bit about whales, a lot about the indigenous communities of the Pacific Northwest, um, and um, and it's also a, a kind of version of Antigone. So so my classics background just keeps coming. Can't can't keep it down. Good. Okay. So our next question is: What was the most difficult and or most rewarding part? of um, your most recent work uh, and you can speak to the the process or um, whether it was um, the research or the outcome in terms of how it was received um, really anywhere you can take that question uh, any way you want uh yeah i think that strikes a chord because i had uh, the three of us were editors of combat social work which is the book and i'm not a social worker uh, i'm a marine um, and they don't have any social workers uh, in the marine corps unfortunately um, but one of the challenges that i had was uh, enabling those who are writing their own combat stories as social workers to um to share that and it was uh, a, a challenge for a number of people and there were some that actually just you know gave up and I'm, I'm hoping we'll catch them the next time we put a volume like this together but it's interesting uh with combat social workers you have to be an officer uh you start as a captain uh so it's like three ranks up from the very beginning of being an officer so they come in right away as uh, being an outsider um, we have, we uh, kind of laugh at this in the book, you'll see if you were to pick it up and look at it, that uh, combat and social work seems to be inconsistent, if you will. And there were a number of people who were in uh, the army or navy or whatever the branch, and there were three of them I remember very well, that explicitly wanted social work and nothing else. And uh, some of them got that. and particularly because they hated the war, as I do, that uh, this would not work out for them. Uh, the, the lovely thing about their stories is that it's really a story of our country, of uh, trying to come to grips, especially with the Vietnam War in particular. And I guess the country was won over by that because we haven't really protested since that time, unfortunately. But it was interesting. Two of my colleagues are also senior professors, one still in the military and, and getting out soon. But both of them have ambivalence about the war, and but not about uh, those who fight the war, those who serve like uh, social workers. Uh, we are totally committed to the troops, but uh, not to tactics. And the book that I wrote that is coming out next year that w went into press before this one <laughs> really focuses on that. And, and I'm happy to talk about it if you want, but that talks about uh, psychiatric casualties and about the horrible things that the military has done outside of war to people who are different and who are not specifically like the typical military personnel. So there are a lot of stories that are untold, but these uh, 13 uh, combat social workers really did a great job of articulating where they were at the time. Uh, many of them were not really prepared to go to war, but they were in the reserves. And so they had an oppor opportunity for that. The challenges they had of imagining themselves being in war, their the struggles that they had in leaving their family behind, because all of them were, you know, relatively mature with master's degrees at least. So it it isn't just simply a, a war story and, and duck and shoot. This is human service professionals who are doing what social workers do in New Orleans and everywhere else, way far from home, in a combat zone in which people are shooting at you. So I thought it was a, a good idea that we finally uh, uh, devote a book to this kind of phenomenon in hopes that uh, it will encourage uh, other social workers to consider that as a career. So that was it. Am I supposed to say anything more? <laughs> no, no, that was fantastic. I, uh, okay. I, I guess I, I'm, I'm sort of in awe of, of all of what you said and the fact that you, you know, mentioned that there's no social workers in the Marine Corps. Um, I just, I didn't, I didn't know that. And it, it sort of baffles me. So. Well, it, it, it's, it's in the Navy and the Navy takes care of the Marine Corps. So I guess that okay. we could, you know, attend to them, but I've never okay. worked with one. Wow. Okay. 
I mean, for my work, um, I think that there there's so many challenges, right? I mean, there are the challenges of language. I, I wrote a book about Vietnamese refugees not speaking Vietnamese, which in some ways is an act of hubris. Um, and yet I decided there was enough oral histories that had been done, some in English, some in Vietnamese that had been translated, that I was able to use the research of other scholars. Um, I also, um, for those in terms of, I do really sort of um, archival research and I'm particularly interested in archives that are not easily accessible. I'm particularly interested in archives that are in what are seen as peripheral locations. And so this is both my favorite part of the job and in some ways the most challenging part. Um, it's the part that I find really exciting. But for example, um, as part of this project, I was able to go to the Philippines and to Malaysia, those were separate trips, and actually went to the places where the refugee camps were in the 80s and 90s. Um, and there are archives there. And there are sort of private archives, there are public archives, there are, you know, old English, um, ESL, um, sorry, English as a second language manuals and boxes that are sort of sitting there. There are people's photograph collections. There are people um, who have newspaper collections. And so for me, one of the most exciting and yet also the more challenging parts of the work um, is doing that type of research on the ground, going to archives um, and really trying to think about how do those stories of the refugee camps fit into larger stories of US foreign policy and larger political narratives. And I'll just say this, I don't know how the other colleagues feel in this room, it's always hard to write um, in terms, at least for me, you know, figuring out how to tell the story um, and then shaping it. And so that hopefully it's compelling to a large readership so that it actually is storytelling um, with real people and people's stories um, so that other people can connect. Jenna, I, I, I totally, um... I want to emphasize a couple of things that you said. First of all, travel to archives, right? I think several of us work in archives that are in other countries and we have to get there and we have to get there at a time where we can have a series of days. Not everything is digitized, you know, and in fact, some of the stuff that hasn't been overly studied isn't digitized. And so it's really worth travel to archives. And then bringing it back, I mean, I, I wonder how many of us on this panel experience what I experienced, which is like, that it's, it's another kind of work, another huge amount of work to try to bring that research into the classroom, right? Of course it informs who we are and how we teach, but we don't always get the opportunity to teach it, right? So kind of this ongoing, you know, teaching and research and trying to, to negotiate that balance is, is really, really tricky. Very, very difficult to write while you're teaching, right? So um, I can talk about, I think probably what the most rewarding thing about doing my, doing the book that I did was, uh, and the thing is, it's the most like the most ivory tower, like ridiculous pastiche of um, academic life. And in comparison to say, looking at social workers and the military and um, thinking about the legacies of trauma and Katrina and murder at the opera, um, it's, it feels completely ridiculous to me. So I'm going to make a case for the absurdity of a certain kind of academic life that was incredibly rewarding, uh, even though on the face of it, it looks completely pointless, which was the conference that I organized with, uh, with, uh, with uh, two colleagues that, that this book came out of when we did it in I know it was definitely it was 2016 because it was just when Brexit happened and so I was like really completely all over the place so that was I mean that's separate but um so the conference took place in this 17th century um it was like a really big private house that was taken over by the French state on this little island in the Seine in the middle of Paris and it's a place called the Institute for Advanced Studies and it's like gorgeous it's got really like tasteless gold chairs and like red carpets it's ridiculous and we so we organized the conference bringing all of these specialists to look at this incredibly obscure stuff so like medieval french literature and philosophy that was taught at the university of paris but only in the 13th century and then so then we sat around and talked for two days there were maybe 30 people in the room and just sitting there and talking about the same things that everyone had worked really hard on and everyone was out of their depth at different times. 
and just learning from each other was incredibly, it was, I think it was probably one of the most exciting, rewarding academic experiences I've ever had. Um, I mean, was it <laughs> how, how, how much it changed the world? I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I should probably try and tie that up somehow. Um, so one way, in, okay, one lesson maybe which I've taken from that is, oh my God, I can feel a moral coming on. Okay, one lesson to take from this is I think um, none of us had computers open really or looked at screens much and um, but we're, we're just talking with one another in in person at length and I guess that's something we don't have right now but it's something that in the, the age where we're all kind of connected through screens and the internet and so on it's really valuable I think I still I find like that having that um, that connection which maybe we can look forward to in you know the not hopefully too distant future. Um, I'd like to connect the challenge and the reward, um, not not so much about the writing of my first book, but the publishing of it. I've heard, I already mentioned it. It was a very long time from writing the book to publishing it, and um, that itself was a challenge. Um, and particularly um, because of some of the um, personal and traumatic nature of the material, um, I found that I was completely... Um, I kept I kept working on the manuscript after um, completing my MFA. Um, after I it did it didn't rest at the thesis manuscript, but um, uh, by 2013, two years later, I did not I, I I found myself just changing punctuation and then changing it back, and realized that I was completely emotionally locked out of this subject matter and um, like. It, I had brought it as far as it could go and I couldn't do anything more with it in any meaningful way and continued to invest in sending it to publishers ever more selectively as that is an expensive and brutal process um, in poetry publishing. But, um, but had basically, um, went the, so had basically given up on publishing my first book as my first book. Um, and which happens all the time. Uh, uh, I still believed in the book. Um, and I had I had um, been a semi-finalist for big things early, early on in the process. So um, it's I, I had I had that kind of external validation as well that it was good enough to fight for, to, to keep going, um, trying to get it in the world. Um, but when I submitted to the WordWorks, um, uh, who ended up publishing it, um, I was submitting to that press for the third time. And uh, at least who knows if I would have held to this, um, but uh, in my heart, I was submitting it for the last time, at least for a while, um, because I had just uh, completed an, another manuscript and it, yeah both financially and emotionally, it was too much to be sending both out at once. Um, and so it was extremely serendipitous that um, that that submission, um, like it was the last time it turned out for a different reason than what I thought when I was submitting it. And then also to have it selected by Jericho Brown was incredible. And I had to um, jump in. I was, I got the news while I was at a friend from grad school's wedding on Lake Michigan. And I, I, I went in underwater and screamed. Um, that was that was definitely a particularly rewarding moment for me. Um, but also having had that experience of feeling locked out from the book, I wasn't sure what it would feel like to put it in the world and then like give a reading tour, for example. Um, and um, the, the other really surprising reward for me of the whole long story of the publication was um, the work that I was able to do with an editor at the works, WordWorks um, um, bringing, um, you know, the, it, the manuscript had not changed since 2013. Um, and it didn't change in, in really major ways, but in, in, in small important ones and to work through that process with another person from the outside. Um, it's, um, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't had that experience before. Um, and um, yeah, it, it really, 
it really changed my ability to put that work in the world and um, feel good about it. Well, I, it's, it's kind of been sort of a common thread between these last few days is like trying to find that home for your work. Um, you know, many of the um, faculty authors over the past few days have talked about, you know, trying different places and finding a home. And I think that like serves as, I mean, personally for me, a point of encouragement when I think about the own, my own ideas um, and starting to formulate those um, and thinking about that process. And it's, it's a very vulnerable process to like put your work out there for other people to critique and accept or deny. And that's, you know, um, can be a bit of a point of trauma in its own, I guess, for some people. So um, it's been very um, refreshing and confirming to hear that that has been the experience of so many folks. So I appreciate you sharing that. I guess I'll just say really quickly um, to echo what what several of my colleagues have have already said. You know, whether you're doing creative work or you're doing, uh, you know, non nonfiction, um, the process is is messy, right? The subject that you're dealing with is complex, it's large, and there's lots of different ways you could tell the story. And going back to what Jana said, you know, a few minutes ago, finding a linear path through that big constellation of material is very, very challenging. And I think for me um, was probably one of the hardest parts. Um, in a lot of fields, the work that you're doing is not going to be repeated. There's not going to be another book that comes out on this topic, maybe ever. But at the same time, your narrative that you've chosen to tell is not the definitive way to tell the story. And so making sure that the work you're doing is going to advance the conversation, not stop the conversation, is also a really important consideration in thinking about how you want to push the envelope enough so that people will respond to your work and, and do more and add on um, and finding the narrative that will do that in an effective and responsible way is is a really huge challenge um, of doing sort of a large project. I should talk again. <clears throat> it's my turn, maybe. Uh, it, this particular book on combat social work, it, it was the, the strangest set of events. Um, I actually proposed the book um, 10 years ago. And uh, there was, there were publishers that were interested, but they were not, they were interested in other branch or other profession, uh, psychologists, uh, that sort of thing, family therapists, etc. <clears throat> but we kept pushing and we acquired, uh, had two, another editor, we acquired someone else. And um, each time it failed, we told the, the, the maybe four or five that were with us, uh, what happened, and they all stuck with us. And even at the end, when Oxford University Press picked us up and um, you know, provided everything actually that we had wanted and, and hoped for as a book, uh, things started coming together. But I think that uh, the hardest part was <laughs> the contributors and what they had the right in terms of their own individual chapters, because all but three of them had never published anything, not to mention something about themselves. So there was a, a tremendous amount of, um, of anxiety, I think, even you know, among most of them, I would say. But there was a tremendous amount of satisfaction. I know all of you feel this way, and you've seen this in your students. It, is, uh, it just is so great. And in particular, those that are have gone through the most horrendous experiences, uh, I think did among the best in sorting it out and finding the arc and, uh, and making that connection. So even though it was the hardest project and it took longer than any book that I've ever worked on, I'm, I have almost 30 now, it was the most satisfying because of the reactions of those who wrote the chapters. So that's it. Thank you all for sharing. Um, we have one 
last um, sort of pre-arranged questions for you all. Um, and then we'll open it up to folks to ask some questions. And that question is, and some of you have already sort of touched on this. So um, if you don't want to repeat yourselves, that is fine. Um, did anything you learn while researching um, the topic surprise you? And, and if you didn't, you know, if you were an editor, um, maybe you can share something that um, surprised you while you were either editing or like it just engaging with the material again, maybe with like a new lens um, or something um, to that effect. I'll just jump. I mean, I think that's the whole point is to write about things that surprise you. I mean, I don't want to write about something that I already know about. I mean, that seems a waste of time. Um, and so one of the things that I mean, as I started with explaining like how I came to my book topic, it was very much the images and the documents that I was not expecting that are the ones that drew me to the story and that I wanted to follow. Um, and like during the course of the research, I learned so many things that were surprising. Um, I mean, for people who are interested, you know, I did not know that 100,000 Vietnamese were returned to Vietnam. Um, and those were largely who did not want to go back to Vietnam between 1990 and 1997. Um, I learned a great deal about the ways in which Vietnamese American activists had different techniques of trying to support Vietnamese who wanted to get um, refugee status. Um, I learned all about Malaysia, which I knew nothing about, not all about, but I started to learn about Malaysia, right? Um, and I learned about um, the variety of sort of politics in Malaysia in the 1970s and 1980s as it affected questions related to refugees and immigration. And so, I mean, I would only say that I'm only in some ways interested in the stories that surprise um, because those are the stories that um, are complicated. And as, as Mike was saying, that are, are you know, maybe nonlinear or maybe unexpected, but those are the stories that are worth writing and telling. Um, in some ways, that's what I think our jobs are, is to sort of find a new story and hopefully be able to explain why it's important um, not to tell stories that we're expecting to find. So those are just a few of the examples. I think in my project, um, I write about and study and think about ancient Greek po poetry and um, we have the texts, right? And we have them and you can order them online and they exist in little books. Um, but most of the work that I try to do is to try to take those texts and reconnect them to the world that they came from. Um, and that is very difficult because most of that world in an ancient context is missing, right? We have little tiny fragments of it here and there. And um, when you aren't uh, a specialist in all of the different areas where the evidence comes from, uh, it's hard to know what the state of knowledge is. So for instance, um, you, know, you are gonna draw on evidence that might be from coins, right? And so coins from the period might help tell you part of the story. Um, pottery from the period might help tell a different part of the story, but no one is going to be an expert on all of the different evidence. And so it's very often the case that you don't know what you don't know, um, but is available to, to be found, right? So a lot of us who focus on literatures sometimes fall into the assumption that, oh, we just can't know that information. It's permanently lost to us. And so we're not going to try to dig it up. Um, and so the process of writing this book, of trying to test the limits of why haven't we been asking certain types of questions? Is it because it really is inaccessible or do we just have to get more creative about how we find answers to those questions? Um, and that was very interesting. And so I learned all sorts of things that I never imagined as a poetry specialist I'd be thinking about, like where where is wood coming from in the third century BCE? Where are they chopping down trees and, and what's it being used for? It's all going to make ships. And so a wooden statue, which is not necessarily a very expensive item under normal circumstances, if wood is in high demand to make ships, all of a sudden the simple wooden statue has an entirely different significance and value than it otherwise might. Um, and so there's a poem about a wooden statue and, 
and that sort of dramatically changes the social significance of discussing that object if you realize that there's wood shortage because of war needs and things like that. So I learned lots of interesting little niche facts and details that really reorient the landscape of thinking about something that we've had codified in books for a really long time. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Michael and Jenna for what they've just said. You know, I think oftentimes research in the humanities gets, uh, or so even social sciences gets typified. Uh, you know, it's not it's not scientific research, it's not medical research, right? Especially on our campus, research seems to really mean what happens downtown, right? And we have to really emphasize that we're also asking questions, right? The question is the mode that inspires us and that we're working on, right? And um, that we, we're, we don't know the answer, right? <laughs> we wouldn't write the book if we didn't, if we already knew the answer, right? So it's, a, it's an exploration. And it's very exciting to be alive right now because we can now work really across disciplines and we can really work across archives and across modes of thought and, um, you know, even very, very different um, kinds of disciplines. So um, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time and, and to see the work that's being done um, around us and, and on our campus, uptown as well as downtown, um, is, you know, is, is actually surprising, not surprising really, but it's, it's very rewarding and wonderful. And so I wanna just emphasize, you know, thank you to the organizers, right? Because we don't always all get a chance to talk about our own work on our own campus. Um, and that might be surprising, but it's really fantastic to have this opportunity. So thank you. Um, yeah, I want to I want to echo that, and also um, uh, say I, there's so much that um, I found resonant in what in what you all have said. Um, I think particularly um, in response to this this latest question about surprising and like what motivates um, the, the surprises that motivate that research and also um, uh, like thinking about as, as a person who also starts often with the ancient text, um, uh, what, I, what I do from there is, is, is just absolutely the opposite <laughs> of Michael. Um, instead of trying to, um, trying to uh, contextualize the the work in its, its in its ancient context with with gathering what information can be found. Um, I think I ex I try to export the uncertainty of uh, the ancient world and use that as a lens to look at the contemporary world and make make connections there. Um, so just like inside out and backwards, but also starting from the same kind of stuff. Um, but um, but in terms of the surprises that come along in the work, for me, it's 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 really very rarely information, and much more often those surprises that stand out are connections, um, often um, just unexpected connections. And I, I have an example from um, my my book that's um, started as an, an erasure of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, and um, became uh, also about um, narratives of. Uh, migration, European migration um, from Thessaloniki, and also a, a, an examination of my own Jewish identity in the context of all of that. Um, but I was in the Jewish Museum in Thessaloniki, and uh, there, was a, there was a map on the wall of um, transport routes, um, migrant transport routes. And um, I just realized all of the ports are the same. All of the ports have always been the same. The arrows are going in the different different direction. There are the, the people who are, are um, forced to migrate are um, fitting, fit, checking different identity boxes, but like this cross Mediterranean migration is not, definitely not new um, and um, and that there's a there's a more direct connection between um, the kind of World War II history of migration in that area and um, the the current situation that I was in mostly working with people from Syria um, and um, it's it's those moments of sudden unexpected connection that that for me can, 
motivate an entire an entire book, basically. And also why conversations like this are so much fun. So uh, that was uh, that was really fascinating. That, um, I mean, all of the answers, particularly that that last one um, from Elizabeth. So um, I've I've read one thing that um, I discovered or learned. This is maybe like not quite as serious as 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 it could have been. I think this is a recurring theme in my my life and work. And this is one thing that um, that actually is I I learned one thing I wasn't expecting to find out about was how people learnt in medieval universities, which has ended up being a big part of what the work I ended up doing for the, 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 <clears throat> the chapter that I wrote in this book. Uh, so I started looking at the teaching of logic and the teaching of how to think in, in 13th century and 14th century universities. And um, so it ended up being a slightly self-reflective exercise. And I, I looked, so I looked at them particularly, I was really interested in the question of what a sophism is which is a specific, I mean, a sophist, or what sophistry is, which is kind of in general, when someone looks like they are saying something that makes sense, but actually they don't, um, which is something that I identify with very strongly. And, um, and this was a really important tool for the teaching of logic in medieval universities. So I ended up going down this rabbit hole and finding out about the different classroom techniques. And one of the, so you would get sophisms, which would be a, a sentence that looks like it makes sense, but doesn't, or, or it doesn't make sense. And you have to try and work out how the logic works in it. And there was one, um, one about donkeys, which I didn't make it. I just remembered thinking about it, which I wasn't expected to come across and it didn't make it into the book, um, but it's this logical problem. And so you're supposed to help you learn about grammar. And I'll, I'll, I'll give it in my, uh, my, um, in, in Latin and then I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll give it in English and just, just I'll be very, it's very quick. It's um, omnis hominis sunt asini vel hominis et asini sunt asini. So in English, it's all humans are donkeys or humans and donkeys are donkeys. So that can, so that it has to, basically it's an exercise to make you think about how grammar works because either you can say, either you can say all humans are donkeys or men and donkeys are donkeys, or humans and donkeys, and that doesn't make any sense. And so you have to think, okay, well, you can say all humans are either donkey or human, and donkeys are donkeys. So that makes sense. And so essentially, what you have is a ridiculous classroom situation where you're doing really boring grammatical learning, but or you're just talking about how humans are actually donkeys, and this is kind of fun. And then suddenly you're thinking about I don't know, like Apuleius and the golden ass, or humans turning into animals, which is a big thing in medieval literature. Uh, and so, uh, and then you just get to say donkey a lot, which I've just successfully done. And so it ends up being quite reflexive. And so anyway, I learned, I learned a lot about that was, I was not expecting to find out about that. And I had a lot of fun doing it. So the way the, what's the, what's the moral? Oh, this needs to be a moral. This needs to be sensible. Uh, learning's fun. It's really exciting. Like the, doing the research, even if it's hard, it is really hard. And then there's always this, like, um, uh, I find anyway, in my work, these like really fun moments of discovery along the way. Thank you for being so entertaining. <laughs> I'm gonna have toy with that probably longer than I should. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to add to our final question before we have just a few very short minutes um, for questions from others? Um, so feel free um, to pop those in the chat. Um, like I said, I always like to be mindful of folks' time, especially knowing how exhausting um, Zoom can be. Um, so pop questions in the chat. I actually, I'll, I'll start, um, I'll, be, I'll be selfish in this moment. I don't see any in the chat yet, so I'll ask a question. Um, some of you touched on, um, you know, archives. So as a librarian, I'm obviously going to ask the question about archives and accessibility to that. So in your opinions, would you prefer archives to be more accessible, which is something that librarians and archivists think about all the time and are constantly like working on? Or do you feel like it adds an, an, an additional layer to your work when you do have to visit the archives in person because they aren't accessible? And how do you feel like that sort of either um, bolsters your work or maybe if, if 
the alternative has happened and when, in which it hinders your research? Like, what are your what are your thoughts and feelings on on, on that? I mean, I, I'll start because um, I am interested in archives. I mean, I obviously want archives to be accessible, right? I mean, I mean, there's no doubt about that. But I think it depends what you mean by accessible. And does that just simply mean digitizing? Um, or does that mean sort of being um, sort of a place that people feel capable of going to, um, both experts and non-experts? Like, I think that there's a you know, debate about what accessible means. Uh, I would say simply though that I, I mean, whatever, I'm an old school historian. I think that's important to actually be in the archive because it does matter how the material is organized. It matters like, you know, if, the, if there's all sorts of, I mean, you're an archivist, you know, it, it, it's not just about popping up the document on my screen. It's about the documents that are next to it. It's about sort of thinking about how it's been collected. It's about thinking about even the search terms. Um, and so I think that there are all these different ways in which um, it's important for archives to be accessible, and I obviously want them to be more accessible, but it doesn't, um, even if it's accessible, it doesn't mean that I don't necessarily have to go to it physically um, for my own purposes or my work. And, and what I would say is that, um, I've, I mean, this again, it's not original, but there's all types of archives. And I mean, for me, I'm interested in thinking about formal archives and informal archives in my research. Um, I like using state archives, like going to the National Archives, whether it's in the United States or Great Britain, and then going to places that are less traveled, um, but where there are archives which are also there. And, um, and archivists everywhere want to preserve materials and make them accessible. And so I think that it's, um, in, in some ways, it's, it's sort of an ongoing question. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I don't think that accessibility is um, just about digitization. I would agree. I absolutely agree. I think one of the most important things is to um, give um, ownership, I guess, to those folks whose, you know, those materials do belong to um, and give them proper agency on how they are used and, um, and accessed. So, um, uh, so I think that's probably um, what I see as something that will continue to be at the forefront of um, archival work. And I am like not um, a trained archivist, obviously, just just by proxy as being a librarian, I know, I know some things about archival work, but I'm definitely not. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm a, an authority on that. So I just kind of wanted to grab your opinions. Um, Can I just add one thing to what Jenna's just said? Um, absolutely. With, with Jenna's colleague, Emily Clark, uh, our colleague in history, I started a group, an international group that's based at Tulane that does work in various archives, archives of all kinds, looking for what we're calling history's extras, right? The people who got written out of the narrative. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, um, people representing some kind of uh, minority or diversity, but also, um, I, I work in particular on people who, who made it to the stage. And um, then one thing that we can do is we can create, you know, files, dossiers to constitute these people um, as characters in themselves who then can be on offer to people doing creative work or staging or, um, you know, f making films or whatever. So it isn't just the archive, right? There's like a whole circular thing of what you find in the archive and then to what public you can bring it and then what can be done with that. Um, so it's a, it's a very rich um, site. And, and I think, yes, accessibility is great, but I also think we have to understand that there are different knowledges in different places in the world. And we have to go deeper into trying to understand those differences. Um, I have uh, something about about archives. Basically, I'm I'm in awe of librarians. I'm not just saying this to be to be to to to, to sweet talk you guys, but it's you have like archives. Have, it's, it seems like an impossible. There are these two mutually incompatible functions of being of being responsible for an archive. One is to make the material as open to as many people as possible, and two is to protect the material and to ensure that it survives. And the more people you let touch something, the less the less time it's going to survive. And so that this is like a, an impossible conundrum, and digitizing it seems to help. Um, but it, it's still then, it, I mean, at that point, it raises this like really interesting question, which is if it's been digitized, does it matter if it goes? 
or does that mean that now no one can no one should touch it because it's been digitized and this is something that working with medieval manuscripts is which actually are pretty durable i mean they're more durable than paper the uh, things made of parchment on average are much more they last a lot <clears throat> a lot better than paper but often the once as soon as a book has been digitized um that's it you're not allowed to touch it unless you can i don't know unless you have a really like an amazing reason to to look at it and part of the problem when you go into an archive is you never you never quite know what you're going to find and i think this is something that 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 uh, jana mentioned and and that touches on things that other colleagues have mentioned as well. Uh, and so um, it's such a hard job for librarians to manage. And like, I've been at the, on the, like on the receiving end of um, librarians uh, work to protect their archives and being denied access to manuscripts, uh, which is like, is not super fun, uh, but it's, um, I mean, I am just like, when I'm taking a moment to stop and think about it, it's incredibly, uh, it's an amazing job that, that 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 you guys do in libraries and with archives, and I'm super grateful. Thank you. Um, I don't want to. I know that we're we're six minutes over, um, so apologies there. Um, I everybody seems to be a little quiet today. We had a, like a bunch of questions yesterday, um, but today I don't see any any. Uh, additional questions. Um, so I do want to thank you again for all attendees and um, panelists for joining us today. Um, hopefully we will be able to continue this event and hopefully it's in person next year. Um, regardless of format though, um, it is something that we plan to continue. Um, it's such a fun opportunity to be able to celebrate you all as faculty and as authors and get you all in one space together to chat um, in this way. So um, again, thank you so much. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day um, and get some rest over this break um, that is, is, is coming. <laughs> so take care you all, it's great to talk to you today.